It's with great pleasure that I introduce our guest speaker today, Elizabeth Horge Freeman. She has an undergraduate degree from Cornell where she majored in Spanish and Latin American studies and went on to do, do a PhD, uh, uh, PhD in, at um, Duke University in sociology. Um, she is currently an assistant professor uh, of sociology with a joint appointment in the Institute for the Study of Latin America and the Caribbean at the University of South Florida. And she, her research agenda focuses on race hierarchies, gender stigma, inequality in families. And in addition to writing about how family members are treated differently based on their racial features, which is the subject of her uh, talk today and her recently uh, published book, uh, she uh, is doing fascinating, incredibly important new research on the process of how families adopt daughters and then exploit them under the guise of being a part of, of, um, of the family in Brazil. It's kind of, as she explained to me, and maybe in the question and answer she'll field a question around this, it's kind of modern day slavery where a family will go to the countryside and find a daughter, a young girl, and bring her into the family and then basically have her work for the family uh, without pay. And she's done amazing uh, anthropological, sociological studies. She's interviewed dozens, it sounds like, of women who have found this situation of multiple generations. It's a phenomenon that people in Brazil are surprised to hear about, but is actually much more pervasive, in, in fact, in her own research. And I'm looking forward to bringing her back soon to give a talk on that topic, because I'm dying to learn more about it. But today, um, Elizabeth Orch Freeman, who also has been uh, active in the Brazilian Studies Association and the professor will be speaking today on the color of love, racial features, and effective capital in black Brazilian families. Welcome. Thank you, Jim, for that uh, very generous introduction. And uh, thank you for organizing this visit. I want to especially recognize Ramon, who uh, was very patient as it took me forever to get information back to him, um, and for really just doing all of the logistics related to uh, my visit with you all today. So um, as was mentioned before, the title today, the title of my presentation is The Color of Love, Racial Features and Affective Capital in Black Brazilian Families. And so the presentation that I will do today is really going to draw on one chapter of a broader research uh, agenda, really one chapter in my broader book, The Color of Love. And so essentially in the broader project, I examine how black Brazilian families uh, engage in strategies and socialization practices that reproduce, resist, and manage racial hierarchies. So today I'm going to talk more specifically about the emotional and affective realm of socialization, but again, I want you to keep in mind that that's actually just one part of a broader uh, project. So let's go ahead and get started. And as was mentioned before, certainly feel free to ask me uh, questions in the, in the question and answer. I want to give ample opportunity for, for that. And in fact, that tends to be more one of the more interesting parts of presentations is really to hear uh, your feedback and answer some of your questions. So let's go ahead and get started. So, over the past few years, there's been quite a bit of interest uh, around the world in families and couples who have had children of a quote unquote different race. And so I'm actually fascinated by how media, how the media talks about these couples, right? In some cases, they're referred to as feats of humanity. Who knew that brothers could be of a quote unquote different race? Um, they're sometimes also called marvels of science because these are twins who look phenotypically uh, very different. Now, for those of you who are familiar with the several centuries of racial mixture in Brazil, for, uh, for those of you who are familiar with that history, sibling pairs like these are actually not all that surprising. In fact, in Brazil, it's often a joke that having a baby is a bit like playing racial roulette because of the uncertainty about which racial features might emerge and what, look, what functions a lot like a genetic lottery. So this was, this was particularly why I chose Brazil as the site of this study, to be able to understand how phenotypically a diverse fun families function. Now, for other folks who uh, look at these pictures, uh, their first thought is, this is the solution to racism, right? If people just keep mixing, they'll mix the racism out, right? What do you all think of that? True or false? 
Okay, no, that, that's false, right? Brazil is actually a really great case of how that's actually not true. Um, and what I suggest is that family relationships, particularly in phenotypically diverse families, and when I say phenotypically diverse, I'm phenotype refers to racial features, right? So dynamics in these phenotypically diverse families actually tell us a lot about the potential of um, racial hierarchies to perpetuate themselves, even in situations when we would not necessarily uh, expect that. But I can show you better than I can tell you. So I want you to take a look at this painting. 1895, Modesto Brocos painted this picture. And it was a, a picture that was to represent uh, race and whitening in Latin America. So I want to direct your attention to the young woman who's, city, who's seated in the middle. This is a mixed race woman who's holding a white child who is the child of the white man that's seated over uh, to, her, to her left. Um, on the other side of the painting, there is a woman here. Can anybody tell what that woman is doing in this painting? Praying. Jim. She's praying. She's praying. Anybody else think you know what she's doing? Thanking God. She's thanking God. Now, why would she be thanking God? She's thanking God because her daughter has given birth to a white child, right? So in 1895, when this painting was produced, the idea was to represent whitening, not just in Brazil, but actually across white Latin America, where there were these ideas about whitening and where uh, there were racial projects being designed to really move countries towards modernity through uh, whitening efforts. Now, for me, um, you know, we, we, we've, researchers often study how race and color shape uh, marital patterns, right? Uh, typically, uh, sociologists, anthropologists focus actually quite a bit on the relationship between race and love and marital patterns. In this project, I wanted to go beyond that. I wanted to study not only how race and love affects marital patterns, but how these dynamics, how these phenotypic hierarchies can shape the relationships that parents have with their children, the, par the relationships that grandparents have with their grandchildren, aunts have with their nieces and nephews, cousins have with each other, and siblings have among each other. So really, I wanted to expand the research that typically focuses on the politics of love as it relates to sex and marriage to the ways in which these dynamics shape other relationships. Now, to study these dynamics, I was drawn to Salvador. Right? And so Salvador Bahia, Brazil, is considered the blackest city in Brazil. Some call it the blackest city in the diaspora, and located in one of the most racially diverse regions of Brazil. So for me, this was an ideal location. Now, given that I don't know how much you all know about Brazil, I think it's helpful to offer you some census data to give you a sense of what, what's happening in Brazil. And census data is certainly an imperfect measure of race in Brazil, but I think it's actually still useful for making regional comparisons, right? So at the national level, about 48% of the population identifies as white, about 43% identifies as brown, and about 8% identifies as, as black. In Brazil and in Salvador, you'll see that the proportion of people that identify as black is two times higher, the percentage of folks who identify as brown or mixed race pardo is 63%, and we see significantly a significant less significantly less percentage of people who identify as white. Um, so during this presentation, um, and as I mentioned, uh, I'm interested in this question of race, love, and family. In this presentation, I'm going to put forth what might be considered a provocative argument. And that argument is that racial features serve as a type of embodied racial capital that actually shapes the distribution of affection in families. Furthermore, the unequal distribution of affection in families leads to differences in affective capital that both reflect and perpetuate this inequality. Now, I've said a lot in one sentence. I'm going to deconstruct exactly what I mean by that, but I'm just going to put that out there to get started. Um, and before moving on, I think that it's important to say just a few things about Brazil historically to make sure we're on the same page about um, this important historical context. So, so historically, there's been a tendency to frame phenotypic diversity, right? So families that look racially different. So there's a tendency to frame that as evidence that Brazil is in a post-racial moment, right? That racism can't exist in Brazil. Uh, in fact, Gilberto Freire, uh, uh, an anthropologist, really popularized this idea. He actually idealized and mobilized this image of phenotypically diverse families as evidence that Brazil was kind of beyond, beyond race and was, in fact, a, a, a racial democracy. Now, in retrospect, this was a pretty improbable claim, right? And it was improbable for several reasons. Not only was Brazil the largest slaveocracy in the Americas, it also imported, transported more than 10 times as many slaves as the United States, and it was also the last country to abolish slavery, right, in 1888. 
So it's really quite improbable that in, eight, in 1933, uh, slave or racism would be over. Uh, but it was still a, a pretty popular claim. Um, and, in retro and to, be, to be clear, slavery actually did have a significant impact on the, in the northeast of Brazil, uh, particularly in the northeast of Brazil, but not only in the northeast. But instead of eliminating race or racism, what happens is that the, the population was actually reordered or restructured along a phenotypic continuum. So embrancamento, or efforts to whiten the population, really belied this dream of a racial democracy. <coughs> um, and as, as in addition to the fact that white elites uh, back in the 1900s actually eagerly predicted that through mestizaje, the population of blacks in Brazil would actually disappear by 2012. Well, it's 2017. They're still there. Um, but whitening was not just a mere ideology, right? This was also something that was encoded in law, right? So Brazil actually subsidized the immigration of over 4.6 million Europeans to come to Brazil in order to move Brazil towards this modernity project, which involved whitening the population. Uh, in addition, there was an encouragement of certain, type of certain types of sexual relationships that were intended to produce the type of offspring that would contribute in positive ways to Brazil's social hygiene project. So while researchers certainly acknowledge the purchase that uh, racial democracy still has in Brazil, uh, increasingly they've been, they've been contesting this idea of a racial democracy based on studies that show extensive structural racial exclusion. So if you all have been attending some of these talks, I'm sure you've actually heard about some of these things already. So just really quickly, these researchers have actually been able to study uh, structural racism and identify ways in which it shapes ed uh, economic, educational, political, cultural, religious, health, psychological uh, outcomes, right? Any institution uh, you can think of, you name it, racism actually shapes it. What is typically less studied is the institution of family. And what I argue is that hegemonic whiteness actually perniciously reveals itself in the realm of families, in part because it actually impacts the ways that parents can treat their children, how the ways that families interact uh, with one another, which is what I'll present to you uh, today. <coughs> now, for the sake of time, I'm going to, I'll, go, I'll, I'll move on to the theoretical part of this, so we'll have time during the question and answer. Um, just in terms of thinking about how I theoretically ground, uh, ground my research. So I actually draw quite a bit on Bordeaux's notion of embodied capital, and I deploy this idea of embodied racial capital to refer to the resources and advantages that one gains from their proximity, their physical proximity to the appearances and behaviors of the dominant group. Embodied racial capital yields some material benefits, which is what researchers have typically um, studied. But less studied are the affective benefits, and less examined are the, is the impact of these affective differences in terms of people's life outcomes. So I argue that racial socialization in these families is both complex and contradictory, right? It simultaneously stigmatizes members with black-looking phenotypes and can compromise the affect of quality of intimate and family relationships, while also paradoxically, paradoxically uh, resisting racial hierarchy. So I'm going to try to show you actually both sides of, of this equation. And as I mentioned earlier, this unequal distribution of affection in families leads to differences in affective capital, which both reflect and perpetuate uh, inequality. Um, one of the things that I should probably say before going, moving forward is just to make sure we're on the same page, a page about what I mean when I talk about racial socialization. So typically, racial socialization refers to messages that, that folks receive. Uh, in this study, I, ref I use racial, so I conceptualize racial socialization as being uh, discursive, uh, based on practices, uh, messages, but also affective, right? There's an emotional element of racial socialization that typically is not uh, discussed in the research, but I'm <coughs> arguing is an important aspect to be incorporated into uh, work. Now, in, in order to address this question of, of differential treatment in family, this question of affect in family, I want to tell you what my methodological approach was. So I spent 16 months in Brazil uh, collecting data from about 116 respondents. And in addition to the semi-structured interviews, I also conducted ethnographic uh, observation in 10 core families and five extended families. Now, as you can imagine, studying this question of differential treatment is not just a, a matter of asking people whether or not they treat people differently based on what they look like. In fact, you don't want to ask that question. That's not how you go about, I guess you could, but that would not be a, a sound strategy. 
Uh, what was even more important, actually, than the questions were my observations, right? Because oftentimes what people said stood in contrast to what they actually did, right? And so it was important for me to do both of these things. So what does that entail? So the ethnographic piece meant that I attended lots of parties, lots of family celebrations, lots of neighborhood gatherings, lots of soccer games on TV. I was there during the World Cup. Um, I participated in Carnival strictly for research purposes. Um, but all of these experiences were actually critical to me understanding um, Brazilian society. And in fact, I would argue that Carnival really represents a really, it's really a microcosm, right, of, of race and gender politics and sexual politics in the country at large. So Carnival, I'm defending my decision to, to participate in Carnival based on that. Um, but in addition to that, you know, I think it's important to say that preceding my official uh, interview uh, time, I actually spent quite a bit of time with folks in a more informal setting in Salvador. And I did that for a couple of reasons, right? I needed to learn the racial and color lexicon, right? What was the language that people um, was using? How, uh, how should I be asking my questions? I needed, to, I needed to, to determine that based in part on how people talked about race and color in Brazil. But there was another reason why it was important for me to use this, this, this pre-interview time. And that was because I needed to learn how my own racialized, gendered, and sexualized body would come to impact my access to data. And it certainly did. And that, that's a different topic that I hope somebody asks me about later. And I can talk about that. But all of those things are important in terms of being able to produce really good research that, is, uh, that, that, rep that reflects the type of reflexivity in terms of your positionality and that demonstrates that you can really um, engage with people using the languages and using the discourse and the slang that people use on a daily basis. So that, that time was actually pretty critical uh, for me in, in order to be able to establish that. So now that I have talked about what I did, you know, how, how I approached this question, I want to go back to a question that people always ask me. You know, they, they often ask me, you know, you are a sociologist. Why do you study emotions and love? That sounds like something a psychologist would study, right? It doesn't sound like something uh, a sociologist would study. And so in terms of why this particular line of inquiry has been a centerpiece of my work, I want to give you, I read to you a quote from one of my earliest interviewees. So I had a conversation with a student by the name of Anna at the local, the local federal university in Bahia, um, uh, UFBA. And I, I told her about my research, that I was interested in studying how race, racial features, uh, how race and racial features impacted love and families. And this was her response. She says, ah, yes, in a family, people are happy to have children. They have the dark one first, but when the white one comes, everything changes. The white one is treated well, and the, the dark one is forgotten. The black one is punished because it is said to have the face of a slave. So as a sociologist, it's difficult to hear this, and for me, not think about W.B. Du Bois's question about blacks in the United States, right? He, he poses this question, how does it feel to be a problem, right? How does it feel to be a problem in society? But in many ways, quotes like this and actually the earlier uh, <coughs> painting that I showed to you recenters this question because it's, it actually asks, how does it feel to be a problem, not just in the broader, the broader society, but a problem in your own family because of what you look like? And so in many ways, these types of quotes have shaped the perspective that, I, that I've had towards uh, the data collection. So I, wanna, I want to go ahead and get started and, and tell you that when I talk about, when we talk about racial socialization, I've organized this pr presentation in order to talk about several different domains that I think help us to track racial socialization through the life course, right? So we'll start off with the baby and we'll end up with the woman who's 71 years old to give you a sense of how these questions shape people's lives. So well before a child is born, its potential phenotype is visualized and openly discussed in the family which Patricia Pino argues is the most intimate and inescapable realm where one's physical appearance is, is interpreted and classified. So this was observed firsthand with Damiana, who is a 28-year-old black woman who's several months pregnant when we, uh, when we meet. Her anxiety about the baby's appearance is directly linked to her fears that the baby will be born with stigmatized racial features. Uh, her fantasies consume her daily life as she explains to me and a group of female neighbors in one of her many moments of reflection. She says the following. She says, I have dreams about what she will look like. Sometimes she is white and sometimes she is morena. I hope she gets her nose and straight hair from me. That's why I sit here all day and watch Gente Bonita on television. <laughs> 
If an ugly person walks by, I try not to even look in their direction. Now, the stigma of black features is so great that she attempts to counteract them as best as she can before the child even arrives. And practices of avoiding ugly people is a seemingly non-racial attempt, right? Non-racial attempt to control the physical appearance of the child. But in fact, beautiful people is often used colloquially and interchangeably to mean white people. So in this way, her reference to Gente Bonita is one of the many racialized discursive features that normalizes whiteness and conflates beauty with whiteness. Now, Damiana's constant conversations about the baby are also partially in response to the hypervigilance of her female uh, community members. She's hoping that she doesn't confirm their whispers that she might have a bahiga suja. <clears throat> Translated as dirty womb or dirty stomach, this is a term that's used for women who tend to have dark-skinned babies. Now, instead of contesting this pejorative term, as a type of gender racism, there's actually consensus, quite a bit of consensus, and Damiana agrees that she hopes she does not have a dirty womb. Now, the moment of truth actually arrives when the baby is delivered and brought home. The affective sentiments that characterize this moment, or these moments, can, sh can, can, can shift from shame to disgust to pride each of these emotions hinging on the baby's racial appearance. So for example, Dona Elena uh, says this about her delivery of her, one of her children. She says, when Neguinha was born, she was totally black. I mean, really black. When I came home from the hospital and her father saw her, he said, ugh, where did you get that black baby? Take her back. And she laughs. Now, while families certainly have the potential to be validated, validating, and I'll actually show you examples of how they can be validating later on. Often in Brazil, as Gomez argues, it is in the family that blacks learn to see whites as the image or the standard to be achieved, and whites learn to see blacks as the image or the standard to be negated. So not only is this an example of internalized racism, right, but the affective dimension of disgust is really the ultimate rejection and confirmation of the baby's devalued status. Now, it's important to note that Dona Elena's um, laughter is actually part of what Donna Goldstein refers to as an emotional aesthetic that's evident in Brazil. It's a disposition that allows Dona Elena to deflect the pain of her husband's repulsion by using laughter. Now, as a testament to the importance of skin color and identity, I want to point out, for those of you who may not speak Portuguese, is that neguinha is literally, literally means little black one or blackie, right? And so very few community members even know Neguinha's real name. This is both biological or non-biological. Most people do not know her real name. And so um, throughout her life, this idea of her skin color ends up playing a huge role in her identity. Uh, and I think that uh, th it's not a surprise that Neguinha is actually the only person, one of the only people during my time in Brazil who refuses to be interviewed uh, for this research. Now, one of the things that I want to be sure it's clear is that these families are not monolithic, right? Families have a variety of experiences. So Damiana, you all remember Damiana, the woman who was pregnant in the first slide. She's actually pretty ecstatic when she ultimately delivers a baby who's born with white skin and, and straight hair. She actually distributes these little plastic white babies uh, with an attached label announcing the arrival of her daughter. And so her eagerness to, the, to, to display her daughter was expressed through her invitation that I join her to introduce the baby uh, to the community, right? And in many ways, her request was a gesture that resonates with classic studies of Afro-Brazilian fam Afro families. Uh, in Brazil, where researchers know that in the past, when babies were born lighter and with whiter features, they were strapped to the front of the mother's chest and displayed proudly. In contrast, those with stigmatized racial features or black features were hidden on a mother's back. So Damiana, in this case, actually received overwhelmingly positive feedback. And then we ran into a group of friends of hers, and the following exchange happened. They said, oh, she's beautiful, talking about the baby. But you know, you really have to do something about her nose. They start to laugh. That wide nose, Nadi Shatu, of hers, you will definitely have to correct that nose. You need to pinch it down. There is no way around it. So an initial compliment quickly uh, diverges into a conversation about how to correct the baby's wide nose. 
so normalizes a system of racial meanings that comments that might otherwise be construed as insults are viewed as mere common sense evaluations of objectively undesirable characteristics. Laughter again trivializes the statements and suggests that the comments are said merely in joke, uh, are merely jokes, until I discover that Damiana is actually holding down the baby's nostrils several times a day at 10 second intervals. So the embodiment of stigma and race literally means that the body is the terrain of racial contestation, of racial negotiation in Brazil. Damiana's willingness to inhibit the baby's breathing is a reflection of hegemonic whiteness, aesthetic hierarchies, and the racialized demands of motherhood. As Damiana's close friend reminds her, it's a mother's job to fix it. Now this, this business of nose pinching actually was observed in five other families. Tanya uh, says the following. She says, I remember my mom doing this to my sisters. She would light a small candle and warm her fingers over the flame, and then she would pinch the baby's nose and hold it. They said it would correct the nose. Who wants a wide nose? I remember the women, our neighbors would shout to us from their windows, don't forget to pinch the baby's nose. And so I think that it's important to point out that uh, female neighbors are important actors offering legitimation and explicitly promoting and sometimes enforcing racial modification practices. As such, mother's anxiety derived from them having to vigilantly modern, or monitor the bodies of their family members, in part because they are judged as good or bad mothers uh, based on their ability to do so. Now, what was interesting is that even in the absence of, um, even in the absence of more direct comments, Lilsa, who identifies as mixed race or pahada, she explains that atenas orações, even through even through people's prayers one notices the investment of the community in racial features. And so I asked her to explain, what do you mean even in, in your prayers? So she talked about being at church, and she mentioned that women at church pray differently. They pray differently for young women depending on the racial appearance of their partners. Right? And so she explained, for one cousin who, with a white boyfriend, the, play, the prayer was, may God give them a happy marriage. Versus the other with a black partner, the prayer was, well, let God decide what is best. So these other mothers or mothering voices weigh heavily on women who have to respond to this cobranza or this, these pressures to monitor uh, others and themselves. Now, racial socialization and more specifically differential treatment based on phenotype was really most evident as, as an element of sibling relationships. So if you, if you remember Damiana, who's the woman who's pregnant, who has the baby. Um, she delivers her baby and she laughs while recounting to me that her daughter actually cried when the baby was brought home and she told me I should interview her to find out why. So I did. This is how the conversation went. What happened yesterday? How does it feel to have a sister? Pegani pauses and looks down. She said, I ran in the house and I cried all day. Well, why did you cry? I asked. And she said, because I am afraid of losing the love of my parents, cariño. She starts to whimper. I say, well, why do you think this will happen? She looks at me incredulously, actually kind of angrily, and she said, because of the baby. You saw her, didn't you? She was born limpinha and with straight hair. I'm afraid they will love her more. Her hair won't give them as much trouble. Everybody is saying it. She will get everything, and I will have, I will, and, and I'll have nothing. She then covers her face with her hand and begins to sob. Now, Higani is easily one of my favorite interviewees uh, during this project. We actually spend quite a bit of time together, and she's so vulnerable and so sweet uh, and brilliant. Um, but even as a young child, she recognizes how the phenotypic capital of her sister might actually start to shape or, or impact her relationship with her family. And her fears of comparison are actually substantiated when she hears her mother agree with a family friend that despite the baby's wide nose, at least the baby's hair didn't turn out like hers, pointing to Hegani. So after this, Hegani refuses to talk. She's inconsolable for days, uh, and, and she's really upset at, at the comments. Rather than reassure Hegani that the love that she has for her won't change, Damiana, her mother, offers actually a, a very peculiar reassurance. And the reassurance is, well, don't worry. She'll, she'll get darker. The baby will get darker. But this statement actually suggests that if the baby does not become darker, perhaps Hegani will, will actually need to worry. 
So days after the, the birth, she's frown she frowns, she kind of resents the baby, constantly checking on the baby for any changes in the baby's skin color uh, and hair texture. Now, in Hegani's case, something interesting happens because she's such a sweet little girl. Um, so she feels this kind of anxiety about her sister, but then there are also these moments where I catch her cooing and laughing with her sister and being really protective. She doesn't want the other kids to bother the sister because she doesn't want anything to happen. And so you have these things kind of existing simultaneously, right? The anxiety over what her sister's birth might mean, but also her really taking on the role of being a big sister and caring for her, her sister. And I, I think that it was such a powerful example of this kind of uh, of, of the difficult affect of negotiations that adults go through, but also kids uh, as well. Now, so in Hegani's case, if you were wondering, the baby actually becomes a little bit browner, right? Uh, and her hair starts to become curlier. Uh, so that Hegani starts to feel better about that. Uh, but these types of changes, physical changes, don't necessarily materialize in all, in all families. Um, and particularly in the family of Chiago and his siblings who share a black mother but have different fathers, one white and one uh, black. <clears throat> Chiago explains, he says, they always discriminated against us in our own family. When they came to eat, when his brothers came to eat, with, when the white brothers came to eat with the black brothers, we didn't eat the same food. They would eat these big fish and we would eat what was left. My brothers never had to work because they went directly to Salvador to go to school. And I'm sure they see us as criminals because all of them had jobs, they had their children in school, they lived in Salvador studying and growing while we remained here working. They don't help us. They recognize that we are siblings, but they come here to the island to visit, but they act like they are lords. My mother never treated them in the same way. So Tiago was actually talking about the fact that the black side of the family actually lives on uh, the, the island of Itaparica, which is outside of the actual city of Salvador. It's really kind of distant. Uh, the schools uh, are of a lower quality. The folks in the island actually have less access to almost everything. Um, the, the other brothers actually lived in Salvador. And so every now and then they would come to visit. And this is what would happen when they did visit. Now, when I interviewed Tiago, he and his cousin, Arivaldo, always interviewed together because they felt like they were like brothers. And so after Tiago tells me this, Arivaldo is also there. And he says, he um, reveals that his younger sister always chirava onda, that she was lighter than her sister. So she always showed off that she was lighter than their sister. He said that she would, repeat, uh, she would repeatedly assert, you were found in the trash. You are not my sister. Right? And so in this case, the racial appearance of a sibling can be a liability as it can sometimes provide a sign or clue about the racial ancestry that a family uh, may prefer to hide, leading, um, may, prefer to, uh, may prefer to hide, leading to the black looking child to be considered an embarrassment or ignored altogether. Just to give you an example of this, uh, Juliana is a mother who was not initially part of the study, but she knew that there's a North American researcher hanging out in the community and she wanted to be part of the study. She would always kind of find me and ask me if I would interview her family. I would say no. Uh, mm -hmm. One day she found me <clears throat> walking through the community and she says, you know, she says, Bet, she come over here. You know, I want you to meet um, my daughter. So I say, okay. So Juliana is a 52 year old mother and she walks me over to a group of young girls and she introduces me to her light haired, light eyed daughter, Adrielli. So she goes on to tell me about Adrielli's hobbies, what she's studying in school, what she likes to do, what she wants to be when she grows up, how she would love to study in the United States one day. She also adds, she says, look at how light she is. Go on and touch her hair. She doesn't even look Brazilian. This was a very awkward moment, right? So I have to kind of stroke this young girl's hair. And it's really weird and awkward. Um, but I, I, I kind of do it, kind of not do it. Uh, and so she ends by saying, you know, I really wanted you to meet her because, you know, this is, you know, we're family and you're studying families. Um, she's actually surrounded by several girls. And as I walk away, I turn back around because something tells me that I should ask her about the dark skinned, wavy haired girl who's also standing next to her. So I go back and say, okay, well, you know, just out of curiosity, who, who is this? And she says, oh, that's my other daughter, right? With a swipe of the hand. That's it, period. That's my other daughter. Um, and I think that this was just the perfect example of how emotions of pride and shame can be shaped by these phenotypic hierarchies, right? Adrielli is considered totally untainted with stigmatized features, right? And the interactions that unfold with her mother frame her as valuable and the other daughter as othered, right? Othered, stigmatized, not important. 
So as I suggested in the beginning, these dynamics certainly become more complicated when siblings are involved. Um, and as I mentioned, Hegani, it, it seems as though Hegani will escape these constant comparisons since her, her sister actually is getting darker with curlier hair. Uh, others don't fare well either in childhood or uh, in adolescence. Tanya actually, I don't have a quote here, but she describes an account of being abandoned by her father after her mother dies. And her and her two other black sisters are abandoned because her father wants to form a white family with this new white girlfriend. So Tanya and her sisters are actually divvied out to other families. Uh, so that he could start a family with his, his, he could start this new family. What's interesting about this case is that it's only decades later that this, that this father actually contacts them because he's actually on his sickbed and requires care. So while he views them to be fit as his caregivers, they were unfit to be cared for as his own daughters. And so this was actually an interesting case because the father reconnects with them uh, while I'm in Brazil, and he actually dies uh, while I'm there. You know, he got really sick, but they were visiting and taking care of him uh, for quite a bit before he, before he passed away. Now, the final example that I want to give to you is an example um, that involves a woman by the name of Corina. I feel like I should say that there, this, this quote is a bit um, graphic, so I just want to prepare you uh, in some way about, about this quote. So Corina, <coughs> excuse me. So Corina is an example that does not talk about abandonment, which we, but we, we have seen that with Tanya, but it does talk about both physical violence and sexualization based on uh, racial features. So this is what Corina, Corina says. She says, she, my mother, would hit me all the time. Whenever I did something, even a small thing, she would slap me across the face. I'll never forget the day, this is a very long pause before she continues, when she punished me by throwing scalding hot water all over me. Bad she. She never did this to the others. I asked her, Mama, why do you do these things to me? She pauses here because she's crying. But I knew why. I had the color of my father's skin and his straight hair. I was white and she hated me. She was jealous of me, her own daughter. Uh, for my birthday, what do mothers usually buy their daughters for their birthdays? What do mothers usually buy for their daughter's birthdays, Banshee? Well, she brought me a tight wet dress and high heels because she wanted to prostitute me out to an old man from Sao Paulo. That's how she saw me, a prostitute. She didn't talk to me for a long time because I refused to go, go with the old man to, to Sao Paulo. Now, I included this quote because I wanted to illustrate the complexity of phenotypically diverse families. So overwhelmingly, it was the darker, uh, black-looking family members who reported the type of treatment that I have suggested. However, there were actually also two other cases of lighter-skinned family members who shared experiences like these. And these experiences are also valid and worth mentioning because they actually still illustrate hegemonic whiteness. It should be noted that the behavior towards Corina is one of jealousy, not shame. Right, which is a reflection of the stigmatized position of her darker-skinned mother. So in racialized societies, all members are socialized into this logic or exposed to this logic of racial hierarchies. And although the immediate victim in this narrative is the light-skinned uh, family member, Corina, she's brutalized not because her mother is ashamed of her, but rather because her mother is jealous and ashamed of herself. Now, there have been some studies that have sporadically uh, been conducted to examine differential treatment uh, in families. But what does, it actually, what does it actually do to a person to experience this on a daily basis and throughout their lives, right? So in this book, I argue that one's experiences of affection and positive emotions do not simply reflect their privileged status in a society. It actually helps to reinforce it by serving as a type of affective capital. Right? So in addition to receiving extra food, better clothes, better education, this affective capital is difficult to quantify, but it can impact people's ability to actually pursue opportunities later in life. Um, it can undermine their self-esteem. It can hinder their ability to develop helpful relationships, right? So those in, effect, in, in abundance of this affective capital feel comfortable taking risks, putting themselves out there in order to pursue worthwhile, if, uh, fulfilling opportunities. In contrast, those low in affective capital can, can experience a type of paralyzing trauma, right? Paralyzing racial trauma. What do I mean by that, right? And so for the sake of time, I won't go through, let's see, how are we doing time? Okay, we're kind of okay with time. Um, I'll finish up with this. For the sake of time, I want to give you perhaps just one example of what I mean by this affective capital. So Elisa is 19 years old, and so we both 
participate in a dance class. This is one of the things I do in Brazil is I participate in this cultural group where we dance. And we learn how to do this dance routine. At the end of the, 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 the dance period, the, the practice period, the, there's a final show. And so we're all called up to dance in this final show. Elisa knows the dance steps. She's teaching me how to do the dance. When it's time to go up to dance, Elisa just sits there. She doesn't come up. I look at Elisa. She's just sitting there. We do the dance. She doesn't come up. And we come back and sit down. It's not until a few days later that we actually talk about what happened. Because I ask her, you know, why didn't you go up to, to dance? What, what was that about? You know the dance. And she started talking about, uh, this was kind of unexpectedly because we hadn't talked about this before. She started talking about the way she was treated in her family. And I said, well, what, how is this connected? How is this connected to why you didn't dance? And she said, the way, this is a quote from her, the way that people were talking, that I was black, that I was horrible, I hid myself that day to avoid being ridiculed. Right? And so this is, she, she actually connected her inability to be able to expose herself to a broader audience to these negative comments that she had received throughout her life from her family. And again, we hadn't talked about this. Elisa wasn't really part of the study, right? She was just a person in, in the dance class. Um, at least that's what I thought. Yasmin actually said something very similar. So her family, so she, she has been um, treated, she has been alienated in her family based in part because of what she looks like. And so she's been treated so badly that she says, she says, and I quote, I don't want any more friendships. I just want the ones I have to last. I don't trust anyone anymore. I don't want to invite anyone in my house ever again. Where I live, I say good morning, good afternoon. Uh, people call me stuck up, but I don't care. Whenever I walk by, I greet everyone and treat them as a citizen. I do my, I'm sorry, I do my part by treating every person like a citizen. And then really quickly, Jilson is a man. And so he talks about how because of uh, his appearance, right? So he's actually very dark skinned in a family of folks who actually identify as black in Brazil, right? So. Um, he, he's actually darker than both his mother and his father. And he talks about his differential treatment, uh, which impacted him so much so that he, he did not believe when people actually commented or complimented him. He talks about, he mentioned the following. He said, when a girl came up to me in biology class or something, you know, even if they were saying, oh, you are bonitinho, I thought it was just for them to fazer chacolta de mim, to, to, to make fun of me, right? I never believed it. And so these are just some of the examples of how we see affective capital uh, play out with some of the respondents in this study. Now, one of the last things I want to talk about is the fact that black families in Brazil are creative and innovative and funny and complex, right? These are not monolithic families. I mean, they're, they're pretty amazing because they simultaneously reproduce and resist these hierarchies, right? Where I'm not talking about passive folks who just kind of sit around um, reproducing these ideas, they're actually pretty creative in terms of how they respond to these pressures of racial hierarchies, right? So I mentioned this, this business of nose pinching, but in some of the, in the five families where nose pinching was directly observed, other families were also simultaneously adopting a strong and positive um, racial identity. Right? And so in some cases, uh, folks were saying, all of us are black, some of us are just lighter than others, right? Um, and we're proud of that. Of nose pinching, some said, I would never do something like that to a child of mine and critiqued other family members who they knew were engaging in that process. Likewise, Damiana, who constantly com uh, complimented the straightened hair of other women and flaunted her own straight hair to neighbors, refused to straighten her daughter Higani's hair. Instead, she repeated a universal message that, um, that was used throughout families that girls should be happy with the hair that God had given them. One of the fathers actually says, well, what's in your head is, mo is more important than what's on your head. But then there are also three families that I label as consistently transgressive families, right? They illustrated some of the most creative and subversive socialization strategies. And I, I want to introduce you to um, the father of the Jesuit family who refers to himself as Pantera Negra, right? Black Panther. Uh, he's one of my second favorite people in this study. So when I first meet Pantera Negra, uh, it's at a coffee shop. It's at a, it's, a, it's, at a, it's at a cafe. We start talking. He tells me a little bit about himself, and I say, I want to interview you. And so he gives me a card that has a Black Panther on it. It's a totally black card with a Black Panther on it. And I say, I have to interview this guy. What, what is this? And at first, I was thinking, OK, he's kind of obsessed with the Black Panthers, maybe from the US. Is that what this is? So I go to his house. I meet his wife and his family. And he opens the door to a room, to actually their bedroom, that's just full of boxes and newspaper clippings of all the neighborhood projects that he has planned as a, as a form of racial resistance in Salvador. It was amazing, totally un, 
expect it, right? And the, the papers are all tattered, they're all yellow and torn, but he, he, he patiently goes through all of these boxes to show me how he views the efforts that he's, the, the efforts that, the, the, the programs that he's planned in the neighborhood as a, as a strategy of racial resistance, right? He sees his role as a father of the kids in the neighborhood. And in fact, Pantera Negra actually talks about himself in the third person, right? He says, Pantera Negra believes this. Pantera Negra will, will do this for the community. Um, Pantera Negra is a, is a father for everyone. And so he's really interesting, right? He totally refashions himself in this image of, of the US Black Panthers. I mean, he has photos from like the 70s where he's in this huge afro and he's doing all of these activities. It was really uh, quite amazing. And I say that to say, for him, he says you can't just be a father to your child. You also need to be a father to your neighbor's child as well. And for him, being a father means instilling a particular type of racial consciousness, right? Which is totally at odds to the, the idea of internalizing these racial hierarchies. Uh, lastly, um, Dona, Ele Dona Elena is the matriarch of the Nascimento family. And if you remember, she's the mother of Negin, the girl, the baby that was considered very, very dark, who her father said take away. So she explains, well, you know, Negin was in fact preta, preta, mas linda. She said she was very, very black but she was beautiful. And though the phrase suggests that very dark skin and beauty are conflicting descriptors, Dona Elena actually embraces her daughter's uh, blackness and enters her into beauty competitions in Brazil. Furthermore, she links her blackness to Africa, asserting that her racially unmixed family possesses true black beauty. She even accuses me of not being black enough because of my own racial features, which never happened in Brazil, so that was that was kind of odd that she said that. Um, this is what she has to say about her blackness. She says, everybody in my family is negro. There is not one. There is not even one person that is not black, black, black. Then she says, well, well, listen, wait a minute. My great grandmother was an Indian woman, and my grandmother never knew her mother. But on my father's side, everybody is black, coming straight from Africa. So in the past, researchers have talked about white inflation, right, that happens in families. In many ways, Dona Elena illustrates this type of black inflation. She inverts the dominant racial hierarchy, reframing African features, which she describes as wide noses, full lips, and dark skin, as authentic and desirable. And she proudly links these features and her heritage to Africa. Yet, in a candid moment that perfectly epitomizes the complex and contradictory nature of racial socialization in, in black Brazilian families. Only minutes later, she states the following. Our hair, black people's hair, is bad. And she's pointing to both of us. Uh, nappy hair, I do not like it. I accept it on others. But for me, she shakes her head <clears throat> and sucks her teeth three times. Honestly, I love my color. I like my color, you know. But my hair, no. I want to be the black woman I am now, except with straight hair. I would love to have straight hair. I do not like nappy hair. So when I present this work, and in fact I have a publication, an article called What's Love Got to Do With It? People often want me to give a definitive answer about race, love, and family, right? Um, you know, do, and, and I'm not saying that in families the love isn't there, that people uh, hate each other. Much to the contrary, in fact, many of the parents who participate, for example, in these racial ri rituals actually see themselves as protecting and loving their child, right? They, they see these things as a requirement of living in a racist society, right? And so if I had to give a definitive answer about what love has to do with it, I would say in love, in family, in families the love is there, but what love looks like sometimes depends on what you look like. Thank you. So someone would say this looked out for, for class at one, but we have time, a lot of time. We can take as much time as the audience wants yeah. to have questions, and I'll let you field them. Uh, if you'd like to. And so it's open and call on people. I okay. Um, I'm just going to bring up the question that you requested to be asked oh. early on. Oh, okay. um, basically, how do you feel that your own race impacted the way in which people dealt with you in interviews versus observations? Do you yeah. think that they were more sensitive because you yourself are a black woman? Yeah, this was really interesting because it wasn't just about me being a black woman. It was about me being a black woman from the United States, right? And this was something I just didn't, I mean, I expected, but didn't expect how it actually played out, right? So family, when I was introduced to the family by my community uh, contact person, everybody was excited to talk to me, right? Because I was from the United States, I was this black woman, and people had a hard time 
uh, reconciling how I could, what they would say, how I looked just like everybody else, but I was actually from the United States, right? Like, how is it possible? You, but you speak Portuguese, you speak English too. So then I had there's all this whole process of them kind of really believing that I actually was not from Brazil because you know one one of the young girls, actually I think it was Hegani who said this. She said, "But you look just like us," right? She kept saying, "But you look like us," um, and so that was interesting, right? In terms of in terms of rapport. Um, and so in many ways, I think that it opened lots of doors. People were much more willing to talk to me. And I think that the dis so people felt a type of closeness because I looked like, looked like them, right? I was a black woman. Um, but they also felt a type of distance. Like I think that they actually felt that they could trust some of the narratives with me because they knew I would be leaving, right? So there's a type of closeness and distance that I think really worked uh, in my favor. But you know, one of the reasons why I want you to ask this question is because I actually, uh, became really fascinated with this question of positionality. So fascinated that a colleague of mine, Glad Gladys Mitchell Walther and I, organized a co-edited book where we invited black Brazilian scholars who worked in Brazil and black US scholars who were in, in I'm sorry, black, black Brazilians who worked in the US and, and black US scholars who worked in Brazil to actually contribute to this, to kind of talk through what it, me what it meant to have our bodies in these different areas, right? Because there were so many stories that we were both that we were all telling, so many commonalities. And one of the, the most important things is that walking in the streets in, of Salvador in particular, uh, people didn't know I was not Brazilian, which meant they treated me like other black Brazilians. And in so many ways, I actually got the opportunity, if we describe it as an opportunity, to experience what some of the people actually spoke about, right? The type of ways in which people dismissed me, literally pushed me out of the way as though I'm not in line, ignored me when I was in stores. Um, and so I think that that was actually helpful theoretically for me to kind of experience what people were actually talking about. Uh, and one of the most um, striking experiences is something that happened when I went to dinner with two friends, right? These are two friends who would be red as white in Brazil. They decided to take me out to a nice dinner uh, Itapuan, and it was really a nice evening. They were driving me home, and we were stopped by the police. And the, the police come to the, the car and literally point a gun to the side of my head, and they order me out of the car, right? And so I'm kind of shaking like a leaf, and they're talking to me. I don't have my passport. I don't have my papers. Um, and of course, they're looking at me, so they don't believe that I'm, I'm not Brazilian. And so I'm responding in Portuguese, and I hear my friends screaming something. And once, once I actually hear them uh, screaming, I realize that they're saying, Elizabeth, speak in English, speak in English. So I say, oh, okay, yeah. And so I, I switch and I say, you know, I'm Elizabeth, I'm a researcher from the United States, I don't have my passport. They don't understand, the police doesn't under, does, they don't understand what I'm saying, but they know that I'm from the United States. And the police officer literally uh, lowers his weapon, these, these huge rifle things that they carry around, he bows to me. And he apologizes and he says, you know, I want you to go back to the United States and tell people that we treated you with dignity and respect. Thank you. I will never forget that moment. That, that's seared into my brain as this moment that really also epitomizes what it meant to be a black woman and how this nationality thing has an extra layer that really gave me privileges that other black Brazilians didn't. I mean, what would have happened if I, if I weren't from the US? Like, what would have happened in that interaction, right? You know, um, other black Brazilian women don't have that recourse of saying, okay, I'm actually from the United States. So that was a really telling moment. The other thing about this, and I don't write as much about this in my book, but I, I lived in several different neighborhoods, and one of the neighborhoods was one of the, more, the most exclusive neighborhoods in, in Salvador. And so I was often the only black person who was not a domestic worker circulating in these spaces, right? So, the, so folks at the door would not let me in because they, obviously I couldn't live there because I, had, I was black, right? Um, or I would be privy to conversations among middle class white Brazilians, which were fascinatingly disturbing. Right, uh, and I think many of them assumed I would kind of have the same position that they had about their blacks, and so um, that was something I didn't expect, but something that I also documented that I don't write about in the book, but I think is useful in terms of understanding how race, gender, sexuality, nat and nationality kind of function together. But it was hugely important, and, and over overwhelmingly, I think that it opened doors, right, because of the hierarchies that people have about the United States, the status that people got for being able to introduce me. Uh, to their to their friends, even when the community contact introduced me, she introduced me not by my name, but this is this is my American friend, right? It, I, I was nameless. It didn't matter. But what mattered was that I was American, and I think part of that introduction was also about sending a message about what type of rules should be used in interacting with me, right? She's an American, right? Um, and so there, there, there were all of these dynamics that I think helped to really. Um, 
allowed me to really understand the layers involved with positionality in Brazil, which is it's obviously not just race or class or gender. It's all of these things together uh, that I think I'm still grappling with. I think researchers who go to Brazil continue to grapple with. Thank you for your question. Yes. Hi. Thank Hi. you so much for your talk. I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more um, how you're using affect and emotions in your research and yeah. if you're using any sort of theoretical um, groundings for it. Yeah, so this, is, this, was an, this was an unexpected part of this, right? So uh, oftentimes, and I don't know if I mentioned this, I was trained as a comparative race scholar and with a second concentration in social psychology, right? And so often when we, social psychologists, at least within sociology, refer to emotions as kind of a, a there's several different ways, several different frames of talking about emotions, right? They're outcomes of interactions, right? They are indicative of a person's status, right? Um, they symbolize something else, right? Emotions are symbolic of something else. And so I wanted to really push that further by thinking, okay, well, if they're symbolic of something else, could they also be symbolically valuable in ways that we haven't talked about, right? So in many ways, I thought that um, Bourdieu's notion of capital was really helpful in being able to frame them emotions and emotional experiences as exchanges that actually are loaded with, with this value that matters, right? And it's, it's funny that, um, that you asked that because I'm working on a piece now that really kind of outlines what I mean by affective capital. Um, recently, um, another scholar, actually a Brazilianist, uh, decided to use this term to, to study um, beauty in Brazil. And it's exciting that he's using the term, but I think that there are so many different ways in which affective capital can be valuable, even in terms of how we understand politics, right? And ways in which leaders try to capitalize on uh, emotions in a way that have this kind of outcome. So I think that there are a lot of possibilities with it. And I'm actually still developing uh, the concept to really move away from simply uh, uh, Bordeaux's notion of, of cultural and social capital to, to really kind of grounding it more in research that, that um, is related to emotion and affect. And sociology is kind of a weird discipline in that emotion is probably one of the smallest sections, right? So I find myself going uh, to, other, to other disciplines to really find the grounding that I need for it. So thank you for your question. Yes? Do you find that over the years it's more um, initiatives and resistance efforts in terms of changing this mindset? Or is this something that people are just this is what it is and we have to accept it. So I love that question. I have a slide for that too. Uh, definitely. So this is, I'm so glad you asked that because I really like talking about um, resistance. Oh, this is so small. Let's see. Here we go. Um, absolutely. And we were, Ramon and I were talking about this. So it's so exciting to see what's been happening. You know, I collected this data. I started collecting this data back in 2010. But just in this time, there's so much happening in terms of, of resistance, right? So right, just to give you an example of this, we we're talking about the fact that there are now this, this group of young black uh, bloggers who kind of have this media presence, which is important in Brazil because Brazilians tend to use Facebook and social media more than, more than other groups, right? So you have folks who are organizing marches. Right? One of the most recent marches, if we talk about kind of the body, is the march of women with um, curly hair, which is happening in Sao Paulo. Right? So this is the second year that they're doing this march. And for some people, this seems so superficial. Right? It's just hair, but it's not just hair. Right? This, this, this notion of body politics is really a fundamental idea of, of related to stigma, related to, the, the, related to hierarchies of bodies. And so those types of, of, of um, Efforts are important. But then on top of that, you have institutional efforts, right? So when we talk about the quota system and affirmative action, all of these things, I think, are both part of this initiative to raise awareness about racism and to, to raise awareness about the other ways that these phenotypic hierarchies shape people's uh, life outcomes. So one of the organizations um, that I've worked with for the past several years is the Steve Biko Institute. And I think that it's important to recognize this institute and other organizations like this that really focus on young people. And, and in fact, uh, Biko's message, Biko's core mission has in its mission the idea that it wants to uh, free uh, black Brazilians of mental slavery, right? So I think that that's part of the that's part of the issue, but there are also fundamentally some structural issues that need to be addressed. And I think that uh, recently we have with affirmative action, with some of the curricular changes that schools are now required to teach Afro Brazilian culture, although they're still working on implementing that. But I think that that that's still indicative of the type of institutional and legislative moves uh, that can be uh, beneficial. I think that the other question is what the change in the administration will mean for some of these efforts, right? You know, there have been some um, 
secretariat offices, and that's probably not the word in English, the sec secretariat offices that have been developed to, to fight um, for racial equality. And many of these offices are actually seeing uh, their power, um, they're, not being, they're not able to be as effective as they were before because of some of the changes with budgets, because of some of the reorganization with uh, the administration and some of the ministries. So we see that happening. But I think that there are a lot of significant um, efforts that have been made. And I think that the other part that's important to say is that uh, this is not a contemporary movement, right? So I think that sometimes, at least where the case of Brazil is concerned, there's this idea that Brazilians are now waking up. And I think that that does a disservice to literally the centuries of resistance that has come from Afro-Brazilians, whether we're talking about Palmares, whether we're talking about the Frente Negra Brasileira, whether we're talking about the, um, the Unified Black Movement, right? So there's so many examples of resistance in Brazil, uh, the Malay Revolt, right, that I think uh, need to be recognized. Like, this is not something happening in 2017, but it's actually something that has a, a longer history. And I say that because I was interviewed for um, a newspaper article, and, and people, the, the, the Journalists wanted to know, tell us about this new movement. Tell us about this awakening. And it, it was really, in some ways, offensive, because it was a particular narrative that she wanted, I think, to, to, um, to convey about the role of the United States in shaping this new thing that Brazilians had never done. And I think while it's important to recognize global connections, to, to just ignore the trajectory, the, the century-long efforts of resistance is a, is a problem. So thank you for that opportunity to talk about that. Let me also say this really quickly. Oh, gosh, there are a few questions. Um, I'm only going to say this because we're talking about so much of what I talked about today was about beauty. And I think that it's important to say that beauty matters. Body matters. Feeling as though you can exist in a society matters. And so when you're talking about resistance, in Salvador, there's what's called Black Beauty Night, where they recognize a black queen every year. And not just any black queen, Usually she has, she's usually very dark skinned, she wears her hair in a natural st style, she has this aesthetic of a woman who would be uh, referred to as preta, right? And I think that that's, that's actually important. But then beyond that, there have been some interesting Miss Brazil competitions where you see more black contestants. Um, the past 2016 contestant is, is identifies as a black woman. She talks about this explicitly, and so I think that that's also an interesting um, development. Not without it, not without problems. I'm oh, sorry about that, you guys. Not without problems, but an interesting development. Thank you. Okay, one, two, and three. Okay. Um, hi. Hi. Thank you for the talk. Um, my question is: so most of the examples that you presented were the the parents projecting the racial stigmatization on the children, but did you see any examples of lighter skinned children who? then sort of stigmatize their darker skinned parents uh, in any various ways? That's funny. Um, who, so not examples of kids who stigmatize their parents. What I did see were examples of lighter skinned kids who were trying to distinguish themselves from their either their cousins or their siblings who might have been darker. But I didn't see that as much with, with parents, at least not, not in this study. Um, and there have been past studies that have talked about this, right, um, where you have kids who, uh, for example, want to be walked to school by the lighter parent because they don't want the darker parent to be, to be seen. That was not, I didn't observe that. Um, I'm not saying that that doesn't happen, but that wasn't, it was really more uh, in, in, in that direction, sibling and, and cousin relationships that came out uh, the most. And I want to mention that this actually happened with women and men, right, so sometimes with these presentations it's actually hard to talk about intersectionality and, and the way that race, gender, and class function, but uh, this concern about bodies, although it seemed to be a huge issue for women and beauty, was not, was not limited to women it, by any means. Uh, men were also impacted by that. Number two. Thank you for the talk. Fascinating. I have a bunch of questions, but okay. I'll try to just do two. Okay. Um, the first has to do with the role of marriage and wedlock in a lot mm. of these births. Uh, it's a short anecdote. Uh, so my, I have a cousin in Brazil who's Italian, Italian background. She has two children from two different uh, men who are phenotypically black. And what the family, the critique is not the racial question, although maybe in conversations I'm not privy to, but they say, oh, she can't hold down a man, right? That's the, that's the critique, right? And so I'm wondering in, if, if, if marriage works as a kind of variable in any way, where if the husband father is in the picture, whether that affects something, or whether if the father is outside the picture, is not in the picture. You mentioned one, you know, some examples, but I wonder if in any kind of 
systematic way, whether you notice any kind of connections? So oh, that, that's an interesting question. So in the vast majority of these cases, the, the father was in the picture. And in fact, Chiago, Chiago's case is really one of the only cases where you have children who have two different fathers, right? And so I think because of that, that makes it a bit more difficult uh, to, to say. Although, no, I guess that, that's not true. There, there was actually another uh, respondent, Haisa, who was a single mother. She's more complicated because she was a single mother in part because she is a, les a, les a lesbian mother. So she had a partner before, left the partner, is now um, a lesbian mother. And she receives quite a bit of grief because of that. I think more so than being single is the fact that she's violating sexual norms, right? These heteronormative norms about uh, good motherhood. So that came, up, that came up a little bit less in this study. The interesting thing, though, and this might be more connected, is some of the children of the, of the core families, this is in the book, are now having children. And I think where I see this come up is one of the, I didn't talk about this family here, but one of the daughters in the uh, Nacimiento, I can't remember their, their fictional last name, has had a child out of wedlock, but the husband is very light-skinned. And so the baby, they, they refer to the baby as galego, right, this kind of term for a very light-skinned looking person, right, light eyes, light hair light skin. And the family's response to this baby is overwhelmingly pretty positive. And so the question might be whether or not that would be the same response if that baby didn't look like that. I don't, I don't know, right? But that, those examples might be interesting points to future research to kind of determine how what are seen as how um, violations, what might be considered these violations of norms might be mitigated depending on the product of, that, of your sexuality, right? There's a section in maybe chapter three where I talk about that a little bit, but I don't, I don't have the evidence to really be able to make a conclusive statement about that. But I love the question. I think it's important. Really, the sure. Um, regarding the, your findings, do you think your respondents would feel criticized or attacked? Because right, any kind of conversation about race in, in Brazil, well, not about any, but a lot of conversations devolve into kind of personal responsibility. Well, I'm not. We don't raise it. Yeah. Uh, as you say, I'm responding to a, a, yeah. So I wonder if they would think your conclusions, you know, uh, maybe they feel, feel kind of betrayed. We let the person to our confidence, and she's saying that we're doing these things to harm our children. You know, that's not Yeah, really no, what's this going is. On. So last summer I went back to present the book to the families. So, but it didn't go as I had hoped, in part because the book was in English, right? And so the families were like, okay, Elizabeth, what are we going to do with these books? We can't read them. Uh, but the book is being, it's being translated. It should be done by December, so I'll have to go back with the Portuguese version to kind of really have a real conversation. But we talked over some of the conclusions. And so part of when I wrote the book, what I wanted to be able to do is be able to feel like I could I was accurately portraying these families, but also be able to kind of say, this is what I'm saying. This is what I'm saying is happening. You said this, you did this, and let's kind of unpack what this is. And at the core of the book is this message that this isn't actually about bad mothers or bad fathers. These are about, uh, oftentimes it's about family members who are literally trying to make the best out of a really messed up and perverse racist system that makes them feel compelled to do this. And so throughout the book, I feel really, I feel good about how I represented that. And I think that that was a nuanced part, right? You, there, you have to be careful um, to portray the families in, within the complexity that they are. And sometimes I, when I give these presentations, I love the question and answer because I can talk more about the complexities, right? Like this is a snapshot, 40 minutes of like 300 pages of a book. Um, but in the book, I, I think that for me, what allows me to sleep at night is knowing that I portrayed them in the funny, witty, problematic, complicated ways that they are, and that, in fact, that all families are. And I think that that's also the broader conclusion. You know, it, in some ways, it's easy, maybe not easy, but people, when they hear this presentation, many of them are in disbelief. Oh my God, how can people treat their children differently? Well, ask yourself that, because chances are in your family, you might have been treated differently because you were a man versus a woman, right? So this isn't, this isn't crazy Brazilian families doing this crazy thing. Um, the conclusion connects this to a global phenomenon. And I think that by being able to say that, that look, I, I, I understand what's happening because we actually see this, not just in your family, but families all around Brazil who are responding to these things. So in that conversation last summer, people responded relatively, relatively positively. But talking about a theme and then kind of reading about yourself in a book is a little bit different. I don't know how they're going to respond to that, but I'm going to bring the books to them because I, I want them to respond. I want them to be able to feel as though um, they have access to the, the to the research that they they helped me to 
produced. So I'll have to come back and tell you the results of that of the follow-up. Thank you. You're welcome. Third person. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Sure. Um, I was really interested by what you were saying about the person who interviewed you, like trying to find like this new movement of... Oh, of, yeah. Uh, I, I was wondering if you felt that in your research, like you were serving any interventional role or like your project like, in, if that is in any way a goal of, of, of this book. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So, uh, I definitely, I see this as a political project. And part of the political project is really getting people to think about these issues as global phenomena. So in some ways, I study Brazil, but I'm really hoping that people take this book and think about what this means in terms of white supremacy globally, right? This, this in some ways, throughout the book, I, I weave in examples from Jamaica, from the US, from the Bahamas, from the Dominican Republic, so this is really, in some ways, I'm using Brazil to talk about this thing that we know is happening all over as a way to kind of get people to think about these commonalities. And I think that that has a there's, a, there's a very political motivation to that, right? And kind of even going beyond the African diaspora, I make these connections to places like India that might be unexpected. But when we talk about skin bleaching in India, what is this about? It, it's about a very similar process. When we talk about double-lid eye surgery, what is this about? Who, what are we responding to? And what are the complexities around this, right? And so I, I certainly see this as uh, political in that sense, right? It's so getting people to think about possibilities of solidarities, global solidarities. And in fact, even that, um, that edited book that I showed you is also political in that sense too, right? Uh, this idea that there's so many ways in which what we're experiencing around the world resonates, right? This doesn't mean that it's exactly the same because it's not, but I think that there, there's a point of, uh, there are commonalities that could be the source of, of, of a movement, which is in, essentially what I argue in the book. This isn't about changing people's necessarily, it, it's, it's about mindset, but it's about so much more. It's about white supremacy, which is not about a mindset. It's about structure and it's about domination. And so this is a, what I hope is a, is a step in the right direction in terms of talking about these issues and creating a space to say these things that we haven't, that lots of families feel like they can't say. Thank you for your, did I answer that question? Okay, great, thank you.